اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا ابي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته اعظم الله اجورنا واجركم بمسابنا بابي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاه والسلام picking up from where we left off yesterday in the case of wilaya taqwiniya the full ability of the blessed prophet and his family to intervene in matters of existence to mold existence and to make it obey to them at will continuing with that now i need to make a certain clarity here i do not say that we cannot relate to them, we cannot talk to them, we cannot salute them, all of these things are fine. All my concern is those attributes of God being unrestrictedly attributed to the prophets, or in particular the final prophet and his family, are unwarranted and it has knock-on effect in removing us from God's centricity. And as we shall discuss either today or tomorrow, the practices that are initiated in place of the God-centric practice that the Prophet and his family gave to us. Now, if we look at Saduq, the great Sheikh of ours in his Amali, he quotes a hadith from the Imam and he says, it is for our sake that God has created everything. It is for our sake that the rains descend upon the earth. We are the connectors that connect God with the earth or the light of God, the munificence of God the beauty of God, existential power of God reaches from God to the earth through us. Had it not been for us, the earth would have swallowed up its inhabitants. So in that case, if we analyze this hadith, everything is indebted to the blessed prophet and his family. And from here we get hadith kisa, for example, the sentiment that had it not been for Fatima, her father, her husband, her children, I would not have created the seven heavens or the earth, or the seas, or the rivers, or the sailing ships, so on and so forth. Now, Kulaini again brings in this sort of a hadith. And Kulaini says that in addition to all of this, God made these people witness the creation as he created the creation. Now, when we look at the Quran, the Quran is adamant. God says, Ma ashadtukum khalka anfusihim. I did not make them witness the creation of their own selves and I did not make them witness the creation of the heavens and the earth. So we see here by contrasting against the Quran that something is not sitting well at all. Then we come to our grand ulama, Sayyid Khomeini. He agrees to this hadith that they were lights sitting at the foot of the throne of God at the very beginning. Sayyid al khui also agrees that they have wilaya taqwiniya. It is for their sake the whole of the creation has been created. The initiation of humankind is through them and to the effect that they can command and prohibit something that we will come to afterwards. Now, when we look at the Quran, at times the Quran explicitly rejects any potency to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whenever the Quran does give any type of discretion to other than God, it makes sure that it reverts it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one way or another. So the potency given to the angelic beings and the sort of functions that they perform, Allah will from time to time drive it back to himself. So when you look at the Quran, it's a message of unity of God, not only in its creative aspect, that God is the only creator, but also in terms of devotion owed to God for creation and for any 
impact within existence. God is extremely, extremely adamant. Although these higher entities are admitted to in the Quran, I don't say they are not. These higher beings are admitted to in the Quran. There are ambiguous references in the Quran. And if Allah wants in the next few years, now in the future, we will maybe come of age and talk about these things if Allah so desires, wills and gives us his consent. But for now, if we look at the Quran, either it is totally denying any worth to other than God, or it is admitting to the creative force of other than God, the potency of other than God, but it is very adamant to revert it back to God at every point that it is only God. You are supposed to see only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we look at the blessed prophet, the blessed prophet he says, La amliku nafsi naf'an wala darra. I do not possess for myself any gain or any loss. Now isn't that striking? We can say, okay, O oh Prophet, did you exist prior to this point? Now the Prophet might say, I don't know. Or the Prophet might say, yes, I did. But the one thing Prophet is telling you, that what I am supposed to say to you and what you are supposed to understand is what is listed within the Quran. No more and no less. So then the Quran says to the blessed Prophet, now think about this, contrast this with the idea that the Prophet was a light at the foot of the throne. Together with, so Lainiz Hadith says that Allah created Muhammad Rasulullah, Imam Ali and Bibi Fatima Salamullah alayhim ajma'in first and foremost. And he made them witness the entirety of existence. This is what is said in, uh, said by Kulaini. Now, if that is the case, if that is the case, then why is the Quran saying to the Prophet, We narrate to you the best of stories through the revelation of this Quran, O Muhammad, even though you were unaware of it all prior to it. Now surely there is a certain amount of inconsistency between this. Who is Nahnu? Who is this we? Obviously Allah is attributing Nahnu to himself. And if it is another agency other than God, as I said, in the next few years we will resolve this. God is still adamant that it is he himself as we, the royal type of we in the Quran. So surely this we, whatever it is, is a posterior existence to the light of Muhammad Rasulullah. Whoever this we is, if it is other than God, yes? If this we that is other than God is after the creation of the Prophet, because the Prophet was the very first creation, according to this hadith. So this we, if it is other than God, is saying we reveal unto you the Quran, even though you were unaware of it prior to this day. Now, if this we is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, then in that case, Allah created the Prophet Muhammad first. And after that, presumably, he created Yusuf, yes, Yaqub, Ibrahim. And in the surah Yusuf, Yusuf who comes after Prophet Muhammad, how does Allah say to Prophet Muhammad, you are unaware of the story of Joseph prior to us revealing it unto you. So we can see here that this then brings it so much inconsistency. Now we say, no, the Prophet Muhammad didn't remember all this pre-worldly, mystical life of his. So we say, well, how can by priority, other than the Prophet, remember it? Are you saying that somebody else's caliber is more finer than the caliber of the Prophet Muhammad? Then we come into another theological inconsistency. On the one hand, Prophet Muhammad is the best of creatures. Imam Sadiq, always humbles himself in front of Imam Ali. And Imam Ali says, I am a mere servant and a slave of Prophet Muhammad. I have learned everything that I know from Prophet Muhammad. So the Prophet Muhammad says, I don't know. I don't even know what will be done to me. I am being led by the revelation, right? I don't know the unseen. I can't bring any good to myself. I can't dispel any evil from myself. But Prophet Muhammad's grandson, Imam Sadiq says, we, he was created as a light at the foot of the throne before anything else was created. How did Imam Sadiq access knowledge that his grandfather, who is creme de la creme, could not access? You can see the inconsistencies here. And then, 
if these divine lights were at the foot of the throne, according to some traditions, and according to the admission of Ayatollah Khui, all the lights of the Imams were there. So then why didn't Imam Sadiq know who the Imam was after him? When he said that I thought Ismail was going to be the Imam. God had a sudden change in his destiny. And now, Kazim, uh, sorry, Imam Musa Kazim will be the Imam. How did he make that statement? If he was already there, and if he knew the other lights, obviously if the 12 lights were there, in addition to the Prophet and Bibi Fatima, then these lights know each other. So how did Imam Sadiq not know the light? Now here we have to go into another series of convoluted explanations that maybe the light then appears in any form. And Imam Sadiq thought it was one form and came to another form. Then you admit that he doesn't know everything then. Either admit this or that, wherever we go, we get caught out. Can you see this? So I'm saying, if you look at the Quran, the Quran does give some hint of something very lofty happening. Yes, I can't deny that. And through that, we cannot outrule Wilaya Taqwiniya, and we cannot outrule Ilmul Ghayb, we cannot outrule Isma, none of these things. We can't rule out any of these things. But the Quran is adamant, and the Prophet Muhammad's life shows this, and Imam Ali's life shows this, Al Hassan and Al Hussein's lives show this, that whilst in the bodily world, we are to be directed by the Quran only. And therefore, whatever the speculations may be, put them to one side as philosophical deliberations. They cannot influence your outlook towards divinity. And they cannot influence your lifestyle. Now look at the blessed Prophet and the Imams. Blessed Prophet never called on to Nabi Ibrahim. He was the greatest of them all, Nabi Ibrahim, right? The Imam of mankind. Maybe, I said I will not compare any prophet with any prophet or any imam with any prophet or imam with imam because the comparison, well, Quran doesn't allow it and it's impossible to compare. Uh, please revert to that, revert to that particular lecture uh, in order to get a better grasp of this. The prophet never called on to Nabi Ibrahim. It's amazing. Imam Ali never called on to the prophet. Now we come to Imam Hussein. In the most testing circumstances, most trying circumstances, you have to admit, this great person is the creme de la creme of humanity. Even the prophets salute his example. Because no prophet was put in that predicament. And the way he fares through that predicament and the way he grows, at any given point in Imam Hussein struggles on the day of Ashura, tribulations that befall him, do we see him turning to anybody other than Allah? And look at how his human gem is refined on that day. That you can say that divinity radiates from his face towards his last breaths. And I know what I'm saying, that when I say divinity radiates, I know what I'm saying and inshallah we'll explain this. Uh, hopefully tomorrow, day after tomorrow. But did he ever call onto any other entity but God? Their lives were extremely God-centric. They were centered with God. And through God, they arrived at the fullness of their divine light that was vested within them. So I do not deny the possibility of these, all, all these things. But the interesting thing is that you go to any major religion, all of us have the same issue. We want to attribute this divinity to creatures other than God. It's amazing. All of us have it. There is something that has gone on, as I say either in the human history of this world or human history prior to this world. Something has happened. There is something there that we are remembering inside and are not able to attribute accurately. And on the other hand, the scripture is adamant to remove it. So something has happened and if Allah gives life in the next few years, we will hopefully try to embark on discussing these very deep and very confusing subjects. But I want to just leave this particular theme with one particular note before we go on to the next aspect of Wilayat Tashri'iya. I've said this on several occasions, that there is no difference between a Hindu, a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim, a Sunni, or a Shia. There is no difference in a Sikh. There is no difference in essence. All of us are doing the same thing, but we are not understanding that we're doing the same thing. It's amazing. 
So I venerate my holy personalities for what? For their integrity, for their honesty, for their spirituality, for their virtues, for their supreme morals, for their metal, for their resilience, for their ability to stand for the truth, for their ability to face any calamity, for their dignity in calamity, for their growth and refined nature. I revere Hussein ibn Ali Salamullah for these qualities. Oh Christian, why do you revere Isa? He will say for the same qualities for which you revere Hussein. Ah, but the face is different. He says, but the qualities are the same. Ask a Hindu, why do you revere your avatars of God? Because they had the same qualities as your Muhammad and Hussein and their Isa had. I said, ask the Jew, why do you revere Moses for the same qualities that the Christians revere Jesus for? And the Muslims revere Muhammad for, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's amazing. You go anywhere, go to the Sikhs, go anywhere. We are all revering the same truth that is deep within ourselves, that we wish to project in one that is outside of us, that holds that truth in its entirety and to which I am trying to get to. That truth is potential inside me. It's tarnished, it's weak. But I see a face that is reflecting my beauty so fully in his own character. And therefore I look upon that person. Are you seeing what's happening? We are all after the same thing. We are all after the same thing. All we are doing is we are putting different faces to the same truth. It's the same godly light within us that is bubbling and wanting to come out. We don't know how to bring it out. So we attach it to the one that we love and through them we grow. And that's the whole thing about a role model. That he is an example for you, for you to ignite that light inside you and to bring it to its glorious culmination. It's the same story going on and on and on. Can you see that? If this example holds true in this instance, then subhanallah, something very profound comes through. That we as human beings are not these little bodies that we associate ourselves with, nor these little eating, eating and drinking creatures and, you know, quarreling and fighting petty little beings. We are divine. We are divine lights. And we have all those potencies. We have wilaya taqwiniya in our hands. We have ilmul ghayb in our hands. We have isma for us to take. But it is so dimmed down and so tarnished that we look at our beautiful heroes and through them we want to arrive at that pedestal of godliness and glory. That seems to be the final analysis. But there is one, there's a caveat here. God says, but give it all to me, surrender to me, totally efface yourself in me, so that when you go, your limitations are breaking and my fullness will emerge. I'll revert to that Hadith Qudsi before we close this one and go on to the next one. And I know Mufassirin will say, Muhaddisin will say, this is not authentic Hadith anyway. The Hadith says, be obedient to me, I can make you so that I make you my own like. The thing is that this is not far-fetched because the angels were told, when I breathe into him of my spirit, we have that godliness residing in here. Can you see that? And that's why our minds are confused. There is something lofty we are after, but we've become totally confused and we conflate things. Now we come to the issue of Wilayat Tashriya because it's very important we conclude this today so we can embark on the concluding, concluding talks tomorrow and day after. <clears throat> so Wilayat Tashriya, according to the aforementioned hadith of Kulaini, he finishes with this particular sentence that Muhammad and Ali Muhammad will command whatever they want, they will make halal whatever they want and they will make haram whatever they want. Now. If you have this notion that the Prophet and his family are totally infallible, they can't make slightest of mistake, there's no error in judgment, leave aside sinning. 
major, minor, outer, inner. And the Quran says, no, everyone was, felt a sense of sin in, internally. Quran says everybody made mistakes. Quran said all the prophets, not all, but those that we cited, forgot. First and foremost, it's totally inconsistent with the Quran, this particular hadith. Now, if they were going to make halal and haram at will, and they have wilaya taqwiniya, and they have ilmul ghaib, and they have isma, then is it any wonder that the religion has moved away from God? I just want us to pause here for a second. Do we read the Quran? Do we get guided by the Quran? The question, do we get guided by the Quran? It's a speech of God for us. Our origin, our destiny is inside there. How to be virtuous, how to be moral, how to be righteous, how to be just. Do we read the Quran? Think about it. Had we been reading the Quran, majority of these lectures would have stopped. Because the audience would have pointed out that this is inconsistent with the Quran, whatever you're saying. Most of these ahadith will be rejected because the audience would say this is inconsistent with the Quran, explain it. Is it any surprise that the mosques are downplayed and the Husseiniya takes predominance when Hussein himself was committed to a mosque? Salamu Ali. Think about this. The dhikr of Allah, that Allah says, Wathkurullah dhikran kathira. Again and again, do remembrance of God. God, the dhikr has gone down, but Marcia and Oha have perpetuated and increased year in, year out. Duas are being recited, but dhikr and salah is being minimized. I'm saying with theologies like these, do you blame then the community for shifting from God altogether? The religion has become imam-centric, but the poor imams, they were God-centered. Which imam taught this? This is a huge thing that we need to reflect upon and we need to think. The Quran has gone, the mosque has gone, Salah is on its way out, and dhikr has totally disappeared. All of those things that God commands in the Quran have all gone. All of those things that the Blessed Prophet was known for are non-existent. When I went to Hajj in the uh, 80s, the first time, and then in the early 90s, I noticed one thing, seriously, it was not nice. I'm not having a dig. I was carrying my Mafatihul Jinan to the Kaaba. And for the duration of my stay in Hajj, I read from Mafatihul Jinan, I didn't pick up the Quran. Now you might say, that's you. But then I noticed many other hujjaj carrying mafatihul jinan. Can you see this? Then I noticed that whenever it was time for salah, we would leave and go back to the hotel. When the Muslim ummah used to flock to Masjidul Haram, a few of us used to leave Masjidul Haram and go to the hotels. The Quran says, you are one body, one ummah. Look at what has happened to us. Think about these things very, very carefully. Now, wilaya tashri'iya. What does that mean? It means right to formulate originally the sharia of Allah. To make halal and make haram. As the hadith says. When God delegates this right, then other than God can legitimately make the sharia. But wilaya tashri'iya means that if other than Allah, who has been authorized, were to make sharia, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either consents to it or endorses it or says it is me who is doing it. So these are the ideas behind wilaya tashri'iyya. Now for this we have the verse. مَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُضُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever God, the Prophet of Allah gives you, take. Whatever He prevents you from, abstain from that. According to this verse, led to its logical conclusion, the Prophet can abrogate the Qur'an. And we admit to it in our theological debates that the Prophet can potentially abrogate the whole of the Qur'an if he wants to, according to this verse. However, it's fully inconsistent with the golden principle. What's the golden principle? The golden principle is that the Prophet said, whatever is from me, check it against the Qur'an. If it goes against the Qur'an, reject it. 
So if the Prophet was given the authority to abrogate the Quran, then it goes against the Quran, so throw it away. So we are seeing that, no, wait a minute, the Prophet cannot abrogate the Quran by his own golden principle. Are you seeing it? Then we have another verse. مَنْ يُتَعَى الرَّسُولُ فَقَدْ Allah. The one who is obedient to the Prophet is indeed obedient to Allah. So we will say from here, what we can actually conclude is that the Prophet has the right to add on to Sharia in addition to the Sharia that God has given. The Sharia that God has given is within the Quran. Whatever is outside the Quran potentially is something that the Prophet is giving. Okay, fine. But it cannot conflict with the Quran. In other words, it cannot reduce the Sharia of the Quran. Because otherwise, it's conflicting with the Quran and the God principle states that that hadith is false. We've got it so far. Now, let us go quickly through the meaning of Sunnah. Sunnah is the tradition of the Prophet as opposed to the Quran. That's one utility of the, word, utility of the word Sunnah. The other utility of the word Sunnah is something that is not Wajib, it's Mustahab. The third utility of the Sunnah is something introduced by the Prophet as an obligatory act as, as opposed to the Fard, the obligations that God has made. Now we have examples of this. Allah has only made two rakat namaz wajib for subu, dhuhr, asr, maghrib and isha. Allah has only made ten rakats wajib. The Prophet added two upon dhuhr, two on asr, two on isha and one on maghrib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endorsed it. This is sunnah which could be a point of tashri'ah and wilaya tashri'iyah. One of the reasons why we have this notion is that when you're on travel, the additions that the Prophet has made drop. And we are remaining only with the two rakats that Allah has made obligatory. That's one of the reasons given. Then again, we get this hadith that the salah will only be repeated if you falter with five things. What? Qibla, if you don't face the Qibla. If you forget, if you don't do the sajda, if you don't do the ruku, if you pray outside your time, and if you pray without tahara. Why these five? Because God has stipulated these five. If you get the kiraat wrong, you can remedy it. If you get the tashahud wrong, you can remedy it. Whatever the Prophet has given in addition can be remedied. But if you are attentive, then you have to pray it as wajib. Again, God prohibited wine. The Prophet extended it to every intoxicant. These are the arguments. Now, look at the law of zakat. The Quran only says zakat is wajib. The Prophet added the extents of the zakat. Now we ask here, when Prophet added all these things on, was it through inspiration of Jibrail? If it, is, if it was, then God is adding it himself. Can you see that? Then there's no meaning of tashriya. That's the first thing. Is the Prophet using his own discretion? In which case, the Prophet's impenetrative insight is so accurate that it is as God wants it. Have we got that so far? However, there is a bit of a conflict here. I read a hadith, it's a sahih hadith, according to our jurisprudence, that a man came and accused his wife of fornication. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, what's the punishment? The Prophet said, I do not have any punishment in my book. The Prophet didn't do tashri'ah. There is a bit of a conflict here, can you see that? The Prophet did not do any tashri'ah. Until the verses of Surah An-Nur were revealed that if somebody accuses his wife of wrongful deeds, then, she, then he has to take an oath by the name of God and she can revert his oath by taking a counter oath. And that's when the rule was revealed. But the Prophet did not do tashri'ah. Now even if we say that the Prophet did do tashri'ah, then we will say, well, there are two types of tashri'ah that the Prophet can do. One are within devotional, 
and one are within non-devotional matters. In non-devotional matters, when the Prophet does the Shriya, let us say the quantities of Zakat, we will ask immediately, why was Zakat stipulated in the first instance? And what was the rationale behind the Prophet giving those extents? Because it has to make sense. We can't follow a senseless law. So as soon as the Prophet explains to us the rationale behind that law and we have grasped the rationale, we will say it's no longer working and we can then reformulate it. Can you see that? So if the Prophet did do Tashriyam, and even if it was led by Jibreel, we will say that, wait a minute, we can rethink this law. I just want to extend this issue further. Now come to the devotional acts that the Prophet is beholden to the Quran. And there is minimal tashri in there, like adding on the two rakat. Now here, what if the circumstances change? What if the night in a particular region stretches to 20 hours? Will we not then be able to use our minds and say that the whole purpose of a fast was meaningful abstention that is productive and beneficial for the bodies. In a fast of four hours or two hours, there are no beneficial effects upon the body. So we need to increase the fast to a day's fast, conventional day's fast. So what are we doing here? Are we doing tashri? No, we are doing ijtihad. If we were to say that the Prophet was doing ijtihad, then that opens the door meaningfully for us as well to conduct ijtihad. Can you see that? If we were to say that the Prophet was doing tashri'ah, then even then we can open the door again by saying that the values that the Prophet intended were not, are not being secured. Now, when the Mahdi comes, the charge against the Mahdi will be that he is bringing a different religion. He has brought a different religion. Now I ask, was, is the Mahdi going to be, going to be doing tashriq? In which case Mahdi will say, I am giving you a fresh religion now, finish. So then the question will come, hold on. We thought Risala had come to an end. Risala had finished because the Prophet Muhammad was the final Prophet and his Risala was the final Risala. How can you come and give us a new Risala? If you will do Tashriq, then that means that Risala can never come to an end. On the other hand, the Mahdi Salamullah can explain to us that no, in line with the values envisaged from the original Tashriq, I am reformulating it all for you. In which case Mahdi is doing ijtihad. Can you see this? Mahdi is doing ijtihad. And therefore, that opens the door for us as well to rethink into things more accurately. That if the Mahdi can bring a formulation of the Sharia that is so different that the people will accuse him of bringing in a new affair and a new religion, then that means that something has gone wrong. The Sharia should never have stagnated in the first place. Everything should have been on the move. We have stagnated and the Mahdi will come and reformulate it all. So the Mahdi will come and say no more pub public flogging, no more chopping of hands, no more chopping of heads, no more half inheritance shares for the women, so on and so forth. All the things that we are saying are fixed in the Sharia the Mahdi will reformulate them in accordance with the values that they were supposed to procure. Now this can either be Tashriya, in which case the problem will be, has Jibrail started coming back? Or it can either be Ijtihad. Now, I want to just say that it might not be Tashriya, it might be Ijtihad. Even though I, in my philosophy, would accept Tashriya perfectly fine. But I think it might be Ijtihad, why? When Imam Sadiq was asked for rulings, if you look at our books of jurisprudence, he would always say, this is the verse of the Quran. He would never say that I am adding this on to religion. Because had he said that, 
The people around a sadiq would have said, what sort of a person are you and the grandson of the Prophet? You are supposed to follow the Prophet in the Quran. You're going against the Quran. Nobody accused him of that. They all said he is the most learned person in terms of the content of the Quran. Imam Sadiq never said anything that is inconsistent with the Quran or additional to the Quran. He would always revert to the law of the Quran. So when they asked him about fish, he said, look, the Quran says all marine creatures are halal for you. Eat them all. He went back to the Quran. They would ask him about the slaughter of the meat and which meat was allowed to eat and not. He would refer them to the verse of the Quran. They would ask him about marriage with people of the book. He would revert them to the Quran. So we have never seen Imam Sadiq saying that move away from the Quran. And he would never say, I am adding on to the Quran. So we are seeing here that no, Imam Sadiq was doing ishtihad, but his ishtihad was insightful and accurate. Now we had a Sims gathering at the center of intra-Muslim relations, where we were discussing the Sahaba and their Sunnah, and the Ahlul Bayt and their Sunnah. Now the Shia presenter, please have a look, is a very renowned scholar of ours. He was talking about the Sharia, Muhammadiyah, extending beyond the Prophet Muhammad. Why? Because of this notion of the Sharia that the Sharia has not come to an end. Actually, we believe this. Whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we have scrutinized the whole theory to philosophical scrutiny or evaluation or not, we actually believe it. So we believe that the Imams are giving the law of God. They are not interpreters, but they are originally giving the law of God, which is more like either they know, in accordance with that hadith, they can make halal and haram, or they are doing tashri. Can you see that? And that is one of the reasons why when we find hadith attributed to the Imam that are in conflict with the Quran, we follow the hadith of the Imam. So you say again and again that the Quran does not have the issue of najasa of human beings inside it. It doesn't have it. In the Malmushakun and Najas, as we explained, meant that they are filthy in terms of their inner being. But we have interpreted that retroactively to mean physical najasa. Now, if you look at the articles that obviously are written in our last year's contribution, that there was no notion of human najasa. The notion of human najasa comes afterwards. And then we take from the light of hadith, and I don't believe those hadith are accurate at all. And then we interpret the Quran in light of the hadith. Whereas originally there was no najasa in the Quran of human beings. As we said previously, if mushrik are physically filthy and that's why they're not allowed to go inside the Masjidul Haram, then many commentators point out, and why were dogs allowed to go in the precincts of Makkah? We know dogs used to be there. Surely they too, by priority, should be not allowed to go there, right? So we see that it is because of this notion that we have of tashriya that we have become very, very confused in our jurisprudential method. Now look at how our thinking has become confused. When it comes to the issue of Eid, I always say that why are we resorting to the Hadith of the Prophet? Why can we not look at the Hadith of Imam Sadiq? For indeed, Imam Sadiq is interpreting the ambiguity of the Quran in a more global context, right? So the Prophet said, fast at sight and do Eid at sight. So the ulama, they say, well, this means that if in my horizon there is no moon, I haven't sighted it, so I will not start fasting. Whereas when you look at Imam Sadiq, Imam Sadiq said, you, the people of Qibla, do the same Eid. The people of Salah do the same Eid. The people of La ilaha illallah do the same Eid. Now somebody came to Imam Sadiq from a different region and he said, which fast is it? He said, well, it's my second fast. He said, no, no, it's my fifth fast. He said, no, 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 it's a sixth fast. We saw the moon. Imam Sadiq said, okay, I'll do one Kaaba after the Eid. He didn't say, no, you saw the moon and we didn't see the moon in our horizon. If this is the case that the later Imam is doing Tashriq, 
then surely the later Imam's Tashri should precede the previous preceding pre previous Imam's Tashri, shouldn't it? Because it's the latest Tashri. Are you seeing it? But when we find this hadith from Imam Sadiq, we say, well, no, it's in conflict with the hadith of the Prophet, and therefore we'll have to resort to methods of re reconciliation of the two conflicting hadith. It's a very confused method of jurisprudence. A very confused method. What I'm saying is, even if we were to confine Tashri to the Prophet Muhammad, and we were to resort to Ijtihad, even then we have a progressive hadith body that allows us to evolve. However, that speaker was challenged that what is the role of your Imams? Are they originally giving us Sharia? And he was forced to concede and say, no, it can't be. They are the interpreters of Sharia. Whereas there is no Tashri'a. There is Ijtihad and interpretation. The only difference is that their interpretations are accurate. Now, this is the point where I wanted to stop today. That with the belief of Wilayat Aqwiniya, with the belief of Wilayat Tashri'iya, we can see that nothing stays with the Quran anymore. Everything moves on. And the Quran is just left as a historical document. The law that is given by the Hadith precedes the law of the Quran. In all of these four things that we've discussed, Isma, Ilmul Ghaib, Wilayat Taqwiniya, Wilayat Tashri'iya, they are all infringing on the cardinals of Islam, centricity of God and the communication of God. And all of this is being chipped away at. Whereas the Blessed Prophet and the Imams never ever ordained this. We are on the narration of the greatest person that we have witnessed in the tragedy of Karbala. And if we can think of it in this way that maybe Zainab could not have understood that how she could be taken as a captive when she has a brother like Abbas. Maybe the little children could not have understood why they were thirsty when they have an uncle like Abbas. And possibly Hussein could not have envisaged that he could be killed when he has a brother like Abbas. I have read this somewhere, that there were cries of jubilation and joy from the banks of Al-Qama. And Shimar asked, what has happened? They said, Abbas has fallen. He said, now Hussein will not escape. And it was at that point, Hussein said, now my back has broken. And my means have become severed. In the description of this great man, who inspires us, who is our life. We live by him and we die by him. Kajabalun Azim. He was like a lofty mountain. And his heart was like a momentous wave. A fearless warrior. A lion in the field of battle. He would advance fearlessly in the ranks of the enemies, tearing them apart amidst showering arrows and cutting swords. His stature was such that people like write poetry about him. He is Abbas. Can you imagine what Abbas must have been? When Hussein looks at Abbas at the very last moment when Abbas says, allow me, O oh brother. He says, be nafsi anta ya Abbas. May my life be given for you, O oh Abbas. If you go the morale of my army shall break. The stature of this man. When his grave was being repaired, the builder asked, Sayyid Baharul Ulum, he said, do you not say that Abbas's stature was such that when he would ascend upon his steed, his feet would touch the ground? He said, indeed, Abbas was like that. He said, then why is his grave so small? 
Bahrul Ulum cried out and he said, فَقَطَعُوهُ irban irba." They hacked him into pieces. If you go to Karbala and you see where his arms were cut and where he, where he is buried, from that point to that point, he was on the back of his steed being attacked by the enemies. Until they say Abbas did not descend, but whatever remained of Abbas's body descended. Look at how gallant this man is. Amongst many of his attributes is one in which he is known as Hamilul Liwa, the bearer of the standard. And imagine the strength in this man's arms and in his heart. It is said when the spoils of battle were being brought into the court of Yazid, he looked at all the standards. Then he saw a standard and he said, whose standard is that? There is no place on that standard that has remained intact. It is only the place where the hand held it. They said it is a standard of Abbas. It did not fall until his arm was cut. He said, by God, Abbas, you refuse to surrender. This is our brother defends his brother. But look at the great strength of Abbas. Can you imagine? Hussein and the family of Hussein are reliant upon the strength of this lion of Hussein. His right arm is cut. He cries out, yamini. Even if you were to cut my right arm, inni abadan wahami andini. I will not cease defending my faith. Wa imam sadiqun amini. And my righteous imam. And he continues. When his left arm is cut, he says, also with their treachery, they have cut your left arm. Fear not their wrath and take the glad tidings of the Rahman. But can you imagine the heart that cries out at that point? Abbas is also known as Kamar Bani Hashim. In the Battle of Sifin, he was of a tender age. Nobody would face him Ali in the battlefield. He had a way of effortlessly killing his opponent. In single combat, a very renowned warrior called on to his equal from Imadi's side. Imam put a face mask on Abbas's face and sent him. Abbas rode into the battlefield and effortlessly put the warrior to death. There was a cry and commotion within the enemy ranks. It is Ali, he is deceiving you with a face mask. Approach him not. As these exchanges were taking place, Ali rode from behind. He came next to Abbas and as he unveiled his face, he said, Ana Ali ibn Abi Talib. And has Abbas's face appeared, the luminous, radiant Abbas. Wahada Kamar Bani Hashim. Then this is the radiant moon of the Hashimis. The stature of Abbas. He is also known as Sakka, the one who brings back water. Now it is for this that we remember Abbas. All have died. Abbas looks at Hussein and he says, Oh brother, allow me to fight with your enemies, for I can no longer bear your state of being oppressed. Hussein tearfully looks at Abbas with longing desire, with longing glances. May my life be given for you, O Abbas. If you go, nothing will be left for us. He says, O Hussein, who remains and what remains? O Hussein, spare my life not. Hussein did not say anything. There was a cry from the tents. Abbas, take news. 
a child may have lost life due to thirst. Abbas goes inside and he sees little children rubbing the skins of the water skin upon their bellies so that their thirst could be quenched by the coolness of the water skin. Abbas picks up the water skin and says, Oh children, I will go and get water for you. He comes to Hussein and says, Oh Hussein, allow me to get water for them. Imam Hussein looks at him, knowing full well that he's not going to find his brother again. He says, Abbas, go and get some water. Before ascending his steed, Abbas kisses the forehead of Hussein. Both the brothers ascend their steeds. Abbas makes a prayer, says, Oh Allah, allow me to bring back some water. Abbas, as he rides away, Hussein accompanies him. The enemies intercept. Arrows are shot. Imam Hussein is wounded. Abbas looks at Hussein and says, Oh brother, turn back, turn back, go back to the camp. Abbas goes on. He comes to Alqama, removes the heavy guard, enters within Alqama, cups water and draws it near to him. And as he sees water, he says, Ya Nafsu, O soul of Abbas, Huni, concede, it does not befit you to live after Hussein. This is your Hussein surrounded by enemies, dying of thirst. And shall you consume of the cold water? And then in a rage, he throws the water. And he says, well, Wallah, ma hada fi aludini. By Allah, my religion does not allow me such a thing. He fills the water skin. He comes out of the Euphrates. They attack him from all sides. Abbas wards off their blows. Hussein's sight falls on the standard of Abbas. And he breathes a sigh of relief. As Abbas makes his way towards the tent, his right arm is struck. Abbas grabs the water skin with his left hand. His left arm is struck. Abbas grabs the water skin with his teeth and directs his teeth towards the tent. Arrows are released. One penetrates into his blessed eye and the other in the water skin. As the water gushes forth, Abbas stops his steed. As he stops his steed, an iron maze descends upon his blessed head. Abbas lowers his head upon the mane of the steed. His horse, bewildered, runs in a direction. And they surround him and they put him to death. As Abbas falls, there are cries of joy. Hussein, bewildered, understands what has happened. He grabs his back and he says, Allah, Allah, and kasara bari. My back is broken and my means have become severed. He ascends his steed. Zuljana, take me to my Abbas. Hussein arrives at a point where he finds the arm of Abbas. And he cries out, Wa Abbasa. He descends his steed and he looks around for Abbas and sees him lying at a distance with a broken heart, without resolve. He advances to Abbas. He lifts the head of Abbas and places it into his lap. Abbas tries to move his head away and he is trying to say something. Hussein draws near and Abbas says, Oh man, allow my brother to come to me first. He says, Oh Abbas, it is I, your Hussein. He said, Oh Hussein, I see you not. There was a wound in one eye and blood in the other. Imam Hussein lifts Abbas's head and clasps it against his chest and cries out aloud. As he cries, the enemies see the scene and begin to cry. 
He turns to them and he says, Oh, enemies of God, why do you cry now after taking away my Abbas from me? As Hussein is weeping, he sees Abbas weep. He says, Oh, Abbas, what brings grief to your heart? He said, Oh, Hussein, how should I not cry when I see you lifting my head from the dust and cleaning my face from wounds? And I know very soon these people will behead you on a burning thirst and there'll be no one to carry your head. Hussein says, Oh, Abbas, do you have anything to say to me? He says, Oh, brother, do not take my body back with you. But I must, O oh, Abbas. Oh, Hussein, I had promised them water. I have failed them. If Zainab sees me in this state, her morale will break. Hussein tries to lift Abbas. Abbas says, Oh, brother, let me be. He breathes his last. Hussein carries his standard, ascends his steed, arrives towards the tent. Little children come running out to receive Abbas. Sakina sees her father in a defeated state. She says, Oh, father, do you have any news of my uncle Abbas? He lies slain at the banks of Al Qama. Zainab comes, she says, Oh, brother, why didn't you bring my brother back to me? He said, Oh, Zainab, he did not wish you to see him in this state. She cries out and beats her face and says, Wa Abbasa, wa killatana sara. Matame Hussein.